Okay, welcome back. Today we are going to do another set of RBT exam practice questions. Um, if you're enjoying my videos, please like and subscribe. It helps me out. I just put up a new series um, where I'm going to be going through an entire RBT uh, exam with you and showing you how I think about it as a BCBA and how I think you should think about it. Uh, if you need any study materials, please visit our website or one of the links, which I will put in the comments and descriptions below. Um, other than that, uh, keep studying hard. Okay, any questions, let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, let's get into it. Okay, first question is a graphing question. Uh, don't be intimidated by graphing questions. They should be the easiest questions on the exam, in my opinion. Okay, because all you're doing is looking at a graph and saying either where something goes or what the graph says. So you're doing visual analysis in a lot of cases. Okay, and that's how we look at graphs in ABA is we visually analyze them, visual analysis. Okay. So what you want to understand is what is the question asking? This question says, how would you describe the variability of the data for sessions four through seven? Well, let's look at four through seven, okay? First data point is five, then eight, then two, then three. So if I just asked you, how variable is this data? Okay, and variability is just saying, how much change is there in the data points? How, what would you say, right? Well, just from looking at it, there's some pretty big jumps, right? It's kind of all over the place. So would you say this is high, low, or no variability? Well, I would say it's high, right? Just first instinct, okay? It's pretty obvious that there's a lot of variability in this data, okay? So what about one through three? If I said, okay, what about sessions one, two, three? What variability is that, okay? Well, looking at that, you can see there's no variability. The data is all the same, okay? So just by looking at the graphs, okay, you'll be able to answer these questions. Now, let's say you get to the test and you're a little confused and you're, you're not sure if it's high, low, or none. So another way to look at variability is the distance between the lowest data point and the highest. So in our case, we have eight and two. Eight is the highest, two is the lowest. If you subtract those, you get six, which is a pretty significant difference given that our chart goes to nine, okay? so. That's high variability, right? So either you can do the visual analysis or you can do it like that when you're looking at variability, okay? To determine how much does that data fluctuate? Now, what about D, increasing variability? Well, when we're talking about variability, okay? We're usually talking either high, low, or none. When we're using the terms like increasing and decreasing, okay? In, in visual analysis, we're talking about trends, right? You can have increasing trends, you can have decreasing trends but you're going to have high, low, or no variability, okay? The answer here is high variability, okay? Punishment can be either socially mediated or automatic. Which of the following is the best example of automatic punishment, okay? So this goes for either reinforcement or punishment. They can be socially mediated or automatic. Automatic means there's one person involved, so either just yourself, just the client, nobody else around, Socially mediated means there's more than one person, okay? There's multiple people and those, there's two or more, okay? And other people are mediating or delivering the punishment or reinforcement, okay? So when we're tackling punishment and reinforcement questions, ask yourself four questions, okay? Did the behavior change? Did the behavior increase or decrease? Was anything added or taken away? And then was there one person involved or multiple people? If you ask yourself those questions, okay, you'll know if it's punishment or reinforcement, you'll know if it's positive or negative, you'll know if it's socially mediated or automatic. So this question is just talking about socially mediated or automatic. So let's look at our examples. A, you walk into the kitchen to grab a snack. You look in the pantry for some chips, but see that you're all out. Instead, you grab an apple from the fridge. So what happened to the behavior? Well, you initially go to the pantry, okay, for reinforcement, but there's none available. So your behavior is on extinction. Instead, you do a different behavior. You grab an apple from the fridge and are reinforced by the apple from the fridge, okay? So did the behavior change? Yes. How many people are involved? Only one, right? So it's automatic, but what happened to the behavior, right? It increased, okay? You still grab the apple. So that's reinforcement, okay? There's some differential reinforcement at play in A. Therefore, it can't be our answer because we're looking for automatic punishment. B, you buy a new pair of shoes from Foot Locker. The next day, you wear them around the entire day, but they're too small and made your feet sore. You no longer wear those shoes. 
what happened to the behavior? Did it increase or decrease? It changed and it decreased. Okay. Your behavior of wearing these shoes decreased. So we know we're looking at punishment. Now, is there one person involved or multiple people? Well, there's only one person. It's only you. Therefore, it's what? Automatic punishment. So B looks like our answer. But we always want to read all our answer choices because we want the best answer. C, three boys in your classroom continue to throw paper airplanes when you turn your back. You send them to the principal's office and they don't throw paper airplanes again. You can immediately eliminate this answer choice. Why? Because there's more than one person involved. There's the boys, there's you, there's the principal, there's all these different people, right? So it has to be socially mediated. Therefore, it can't be our answer. And then D, it usually takes you 30 minutes to get to work. Today, you try a new route and turn down a different street. You get to work 10 minutes faster and now always take that route. So did the behavior change? Yes. Okay. Did it increase or decrease? Well, it increased, right? Your behavior of taking that different route, it's going to increase. And then is it one person or multiple people? Well, it's only you, only you in the car. Therefore, what? It's automatic. But it's automatic reinforcement. So the answer here is B. Differential reinforcement is vital in applied behavior analysis. What does differential reinforcement teach? Okay, so differential reinforcement is very important to understand, right? We're reinforcing one behavior and putting other behaviors on extinction, okay? This is how we teach. This is how we change behavior, okay? You're going to be doing constantly as an RVT. So what does it actually teach? Well, let's look at A, discrimination. Can we teach discrimination with differential reinforcement? Well, consider an example where I want to teach a child to identify a dog and not a cat. So when I say point to dog, I want them to point to dog. How would I teach that? Well, anytime they point to the dog, I give them a reinforcer. They point to the cat, it's on extinction. Eventually they're gonna learn, okay, dog is dog, but cat is not dog, right? They're discriminating between the two animals. So yeah, we can teach discrimination. What about B, differentiation? So differentiation, okay, is similar, except now we're teaching two different responses. Okay, not two different stimuli, two different responses. So consider uh, the credit card machines <clears throat> where we used to swipe the credit cards and now we insert the chip card, right, in the machine. Um, so a lot of places now, if you swipe, it won't let you pay and it'll prompt you to insert your card. Okay, so the swiping behavior is on extinction. The insert behavior is reinforced. What happened? Differential reinforcement taught you a different response. So it taught you differentiation. So B is yes. What about C, good behavior? Now think about it. Can we teach good behavior with differential reinforcement? Yes. But can we also teach bad behavior and behavior we don't want to see? Yes, right? So differential reinforcement can teach good behavior, but it doesn't always teach good behavior, okay? Differential reinforcement teaches behavior just in general, right? Now, if it's good or bad depends on your implementation and what you're reinforcing. Okay, so the best answer here is discrimination and differentiation, both A and B. All right, you are chatting with your friend and they mentioned that they just watched the funniest movie they have ever seen. After you're done talking to your friend, you go on Netflix and search for the movie. You find the movie and start to watch it. It is the funniest movie you have ever seen. So you text your friend and let them know, let them know. What represents the SD for watching the movie in this scenario? All right, a lot going on. Lot to unpack in this question, okay? So start with what, what are they asking? They're asking for you to identify the SD, right? The, dip, the discriminative stimuli and what is signaling that reinforcement is available, okay? So remember, our SDs, okay, tell us that the reinforcement is now available, okay? If we don't have an SD, the reinforcement is not available, okay? So think about um, if you're thirsty, Okay, so you really want a Dr. Pepper, you go to your fridge, you open it, there's no Dr. Pepper, therefore there's no SD, and therefore you can't drink Dr. Pepper, okay? So you might have the motivation, you might have the want, but unless there's an SD, okay, you're not going to receive the reinforcer. So in this scenario, let's look at it, okay? What is the SD? Is chatting with your friend the SD? Well, ask yourself, does chatting with your friend signal, okay, there's reinforcement available for the movie? No, right? We don't, we haven't even got there yet, one, but two, it doesn't tell you anything about the availability of watching the movie, okay? So A is out. B, your friend telling you about the funny movie. 
So what did your friend telling you about the movie do? Did it make you want to watch the movie? Did it increase the value of the movie? Yes. But did it tell you the movie is available? No, right? So now you really want to watch the movie. Your friend increased your motivation, served as a motivating operation, but it still doesn't say, hey, watching the movie is available. There is no SD. C, you finding the movie on Netflix. Here we go. Finally, okay. Finally, there's an SD saying the movie is available. We can now watch the movie, okay? Not until you found it on Netflix and saw the movie was available, okay, could you watch that movie. So you, fi you find in the movie, you sing the movie, signals, reinforcement is available, and you can now watch the movie. And then D, you texting your friend the movie was indeed hilarious as a consequence, okay, it happens after the behavior. Okay, so the best answer here is C. This is a great ABA question, okay? Really understand and break down, okay, what makes B a motivating operation? What makes C an SD? And then what makes D, okay, a consequence? If you understand this, okay, behavior questions are gonna get really easy on the, the exam, okay? So this is a really good question for you to think about. All right, your company just picked up a new client. The BCBA wants to start the assessment as soon as possible and ask you to help her with indirect assessments. Which of the following would not be an example of an indirect assessment? So remember, we have indirect assessments and we have direct. What's an indirect assessment? An indirect assessment is when you're not observing the client. Okay. A direct assessment is when you are observing the client. So let's look at our answer choices. A, you call the new parent on the phone and ask them several questions about the child's likes, dislikes, and history. In other words, you interview them, okay? So A is a classic example of what? An indirect assessment, okay? So that can't be our, our answer. B, you email a checklist of items for the parent to complete before first day of services. There is also a comment box below for the parent to provide feedback. Again, what are you doing? You're sending some questions and a checklist, okay, to the parents, right? Are you observing any, any client behavior? No. So again, B is still an indirect assessment. Checklists are, okay, indirect. Surveys are indirect. C, you ask the parent to visit the center and you give them a tour. While you are giving them a tour, you ask about the behavioral history of their child. Okay, now we're talking about behavior, but still, are you observing anything? Are you watching the client with your own eyes? No, we can't make assumptions and judgments based off just the history alone, okay? So that's why it's an indirect assessment because we're not observing directly anything. So C is not it. So it us with D, you ask the parent to visit the center, they bring the client with them. While there, the client explores the clinic. You take notes on the client's interactions with peers and any behaviors you notice. Okay, finally, you're observing the client, okay? You're, you're taking notes, okay? You might even be taking data, Okay, you're directly assessing them, right? So D is not a indirect assessment. Withholding a snack or an item from a client until session in order to increase the value of that snack or item is called what? So we know this snack, okay? The client likes the snack or likes this item. So we wanna keep it from them and withhold it from them, okay? To increase the value, um, alter the motivation, okay? Of that uh, item or snack. So what is that called? Is it satiation, deprivation, unethical, or punishment? Well, satiation would be the opposite, okay? That would be like we gave them too much ice cream, and now they don't want any ice cream anymore. They're satiated, okay? What about unethical? Is this unethical? Well, no, okay? It's unethical to withhold, you know, food and water, basic, basic food and water, okay? So if you just don't let them eat, right? Yes. But just withholding a certain dessert or a snack is not an ethical. It's a antecedent intervention, okay? And then punishment. Are we punishing anything here, okay? No, there's no behavior change involved, okay? Nothing is being targeted, right? So we're not punishing anything. Therefore, what are we doing? We are depriving them, okay, of that snack or item, okay? Therefore, this is called deprivation. So think about the difference. Satiation is too much. Deprivation is not enough. Okay, John is running body part identification with his client during DTT. John says, touch your nose. The client touches their ears.
John says, that's not it, and prompts the client to touch their nose. John then starts a new trial. Did John deliver the prompt correctly? So think about it, okay? Think about when does the prompt occur, okay? What's the purpose of a prompt, right? So the purpose of a prompt, right, is to evoke the correct behavior, okay? And if you want to evoke the correct behavior, when should that prompt occur? What should occur before the behavior happens, right? What good does the prompt do after the behavior and after the consequence, okay? Because you're still just starting that trial over, right? So they're just going to probably do the same behavior, right? That prompt needs to come before the behavior because the whole goal is prompting out the right behavior, okay? So let's look at our answer choices. A, yes, the prompt comes after the behavior. No, prompt always comes before. This scenario is so common with new RBTs is where after the behavior is wrong, after the consequence, the RBT will prompt the right answer and then open a new trial, okay? The goal here is to reinforce good behavior, and the right behavior, and the target behavior, okay? So you're really reinforcing the prompt, and the prompt becomes an SD, okay? Now you have to transfer that later, right? But the prompt, think about the prompt as just a second SD, okay? And you know the SD comes before the behavior, therefore the prompt has to come before the behavior. Okay, B, no, the prompt comes before the behavior. Yes. C, no, John forgot to reinforce the prompt, okay? Well, yes, right? He didn't reinforce the prompt, but that's not the, the problem here, right? So the, pro uh, the problem is, okay, problem is the prompt didn't come before the behavior. Okay, so B is the best answer in this scenario, okay? D, yes, because, and also, right, you don't reinforce the prompt, you reinforce the behavior, right? You're not reinforcing the SD, you're reinforcing the behavior, okay? So C is incorrect. D, yes, the prompt can happen anytime during a trial. Incorrect, right? The prompt has to come before the behavior, okay? So again, think about the prompt as another SD, okay, to evoke the behavior you want to see. The SD comes before the behavior. The prompt comes after the SD, but before the behavior. Okay, which of the following is not true about stimulus preference assessments? All right, what are our stimulus preference assessments? Okay, we're trying to identify what a client likes. Okay, we have single choice, force choice, and then multiple stimulus. So what are we really doing with a stimulus preference assessment? A. They are used to identify reinforcers for the client. No, big no-no, okay? When you're finding out what a client likes, just because they like it doesn't make it a reinforcer, okay? It's not a reinforcer unless it can be used to change behavior, okay? So A is wrong. B, they are used to identify potential reinforcers. Yes, okay? You're finding out what they like, okay, in hopes of it, what? acting as a reinforcer and changing behavior, okay? So B is great, okay? Um, C, a forced choice stimulus preference assessment can be used to establish a hierarchy. Is this true? Okay, we'll think about a forced choice, okay? We offer two items, client picks one, okay? We were offer two more items, client picks one. We offer two more items, okay? So let's say we have three items. So now we offer all three, okay, together. Okay, if you have iPad, cup, pencil, okay, first time they chose iPad, and then they chose iPad again, and then they chose the cup, okay, and finally the pencil. So what did you do? Well, you established a hierarchy. iPad is number one, cup is number two, pencil is number three. So C is correct. And the D, stimulus preference assessments should be done directly with the client. Yes, right, you shouldn't read checklists and you shouldn't read articles about what kids like. You should always be finding out what they like directly, okay? You can ask them, you can do preference assessments, okay? Even parents aren't the most reliable, okay? For older kids, parents might have not, don't have any clue, okay, potentially what the kid likes. So stimulus preference assessments ideally should be done with the client. So our answer, what is not true, is what? They are used to identify reinforcers. Okay, Timmy lives with his mom during the week and with his dad on weekends. At mom's house, he sweeps the floor. This weekend, he swept the floor at dad's house for the first time. If dad wants Timmy to continue this behavior, what should he do? So what does dad want to do? Dad wants to maintain behavior, okay? And what do we use to maintain behavior? We use reinforcement, right? 
So let's look at our answer choices. He should require Timmy to sweep the floor at grandparents' house too. Okay, so how is this going to maintain behavior of sweeping at dad's house? Okay, there's no indication that Timmy sweeping the floor at grandparents' house as well, okay, would maintain behavior. Okay, um, there's no, nothing related, right, um, in that scenario. So A is out. B, Timmy should be, be required to sleep the, sweep the floor every day. Well, think about it, okay? If he's required to sweep the floor every day, right, what might happen? He might satiate on sweeping the floor, okay, satiation, and the motivation to sweep the floor would now be gone, okay? So B is not right, right? We want to maintain sweeping the floor. We want to make sure he continues sweeping it. C, dad should set up a reinforcement schedule for Timmy. Yes, right? Timmy knows how to, how to sweep the floor. He sweeps the floor, okay? So we want to reinforce that behavior to make sure it continues. How do we do that? Reinforcement schedule. So maybe dad pays Timmy $5 when he sweeps the floor or he cooks him his favorite dinner or something. But we maintain behavior, okay, through intermittent reinforcement. So dad should set up a intermittent reinforcement schedule for Timmy. And then D, dad should now teach and require Timmy to mop and vacuum as well. Again, teaching him to mop and vacuum, good life skills, okay? But how is that going to maintain sweeping the floor, okay? So our answer here is C, set up a reinforcement schedule for Timmy. You're starting with a new client on Thursday who has a history of pulling hair and grabbing jewelry. All of the following represent antecedent interventions you can implement, except what? So you know your client is handsy, okay? There's possibly crisis at play here, right? If they're pulling your hair and grabbing jewelry and things like that. So what can you do as an antecedent intervention? Well, what is an antecedent inter intervention? Does it occur before or after the behavior? It occurs before. So you're manipulating things before the behavior occurs. So our answer choices. A, you could wear your hair in a ponytail. Sure, right? Put your hair up. Don't give them the opportunity to grab long hair, okay? So what do you, you're putting your hair before the behavior. So A, yes, is an antecedent intervention. B, you take off all jewelry before session started. Again, what are you doing? Okay, you're changing something before behavior happens. You're manipulating the environment before the behavior happens, okay? So therefore, it's an antecedent intervention of taking off jewelry. So B looks good too. What about C? You can stay out of arm's length of Timmy during the times he is known to pull hair. Yes, right? You've identified when this happens. So before he can pull your hair, right, you create space and you keep your distance. Now, given the behavior and everything, right, this might not be possible, but it is an option, right, to not even put this for yourself in the situation for the behavior to happen. Okay, so C looks good. What about you could reinforce Timmy every five minutes for not pulling hair. Well, you should immediately know this is wrong. Why? Because reinforcement is what? A consequence. What are we looking for? Antecedent interventions. Therefore, what? D, right? Okay, so this is pretty common, right? If you know your client and you know their behavior and you know their actions, okay, you should come prepared, okay, for those scenarios. And if you know a client, okay, is a pincher, right, or a scratcher, well, you might want to wear sleeves. If they're a hair puller, well, don't have your hair, okay, down and flowing everywhere, okay? If they grab watches and jewelry, don't wear your watches and jewelry, okay? If they're going to rip your clothes, don't wear nice clothes, okay? Think about antecedent interventions. They're preventative, okay? They happen before the behavior happens. When you react, okay, that is a consequence intervention, okay? Always try to figure out what can I do to manipulate the environment given the behavior. Okay, that does it uh, for today. More videos coming Friday and next week. Check out my new series. Um, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And again, any study materials, I'll put the links down below. Um, any questions, I'm happy to ask. Keep studying hard, okay? It's gonna pay off, you can do it.